Heavenly Father, we thank you that during this time we can meet together, although we long to be together face to face. We pray that you bless us now as we hear your words, speak to us words of hope and comfort and help us to encourage others with those words. We pray in Jesus name. Amen. Well, I don't know um, if you remember first hearing about Jesus or if there was a time that you can uh, recollect when you came to faith. Uh, if you've ever met someone who uh, has got to that point, maybe someone who didn't grow up in a Christian family, then you'll probably have experienced their questions, their hunger to know more. And often those questions are really urgent because after all, they've just discovered something that completely changes their whole outlook on life. Something that gives them a new identity. And so it's only right, isn't it, that they've got questions. But along with those questions comes the joy of discovering that Jesus came for us, for those with our failings and flaws, so that we can turn away from sin, turn away from living for ourselves to live for God, to receive his grace and his love. It's incredible, isn't it? And so it's not surprising uh, that people have questions. But maybe you can relate to others who have questions. Maybe you remember whether it's your own child or a grandchild or uh, another child from church, uh, asking those why questions. Uh, maybe you can remember them. Why is the sky blue is the last one that we had um, on uh, repeat. And uh, no matter whether you uh, know about absorption of light in the atmosphere or um, those kind of things, it doesn't matter how well you answer the question, there's always another one that comes. Why? And uh, that can go on. Uh, endlessly, it seems. Well, today's uh, reading comes from 1 Thessalonians, and it was written to a community who were coping with all sorts of things, with the death of family and friends, with persecution because of their faith. And despite these circumstances, they were flourishing because of the hope that they had found in Jesus. And so Paul's writing to them to uh, encourage them, uh, and also to challenge them. But they've got some really big questions, like what happens when we die? And we were looking at that last week. And Paul in chapter four says, for the Lord himself will come down from heaven and then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. I have to say at the moment, it's hard to tell uh, what's going on with the world around us, with certain politicians denying facts and undermining democracy, a lockdown which has led to the closure of churches without any uh, seeming evidence that they pose a risk, Brexit and a global pa pandemic. And so it's probably right that many of us are searching for something firm, something to hold on to in these times. And so Paul says in chapter five, verse one, you know very well that the day of the Lord will come. I wonder if we would agree with him. I wonder if that's something that's on our mind. Are we confident that Jesus is coming back? Because Paul says that no matter what happens, Jesus is coming back. It's a fact. We may not know when, Paul says, because he will return like a thief in the night, maybe when we least expect it. Could be at the end of this lockdown, it could be tomorrow. But there's one thing for certain, that Jesus is coming back and we don't know when. And so Paul quickly preempts the next question. I'm sure he'd had people ask him this. If Jesus is coming back, do we have to worry? What's going to happen? Well, Paul says we don't have to worry because we are new creations. For those who believe in Jesus, it's not going to be a surprise either because, he says, we are children of the day. 
When Jesus returns, it will be like a new day. The light has come. Jesus, the light of the world, has arrived. But even though governments will try to bring peace and order themselves, even though they try and bring a new day, some will be destroyed, it says, and others saved. Now, you only have to go back to the day that Paul was writing this letter to realise that the Roman rulers of his day proclaimed peace and safety. But the peace and safety that they seemed to um, celebrate was brought about with violent oppression, military occupation and enslaving people. It's far from peace, far from safety for many people. But when Jesus will bring peace, he did it by giving his own life, not taking others. He did it by dying to serve us and coming back to put things right. So we're no longer in the dark. We're children of the light. A new creation in Jesus created to live for him and not like the world around us. Which is precisely why Paul uses this picture of night and day as it's like those who don't know Jesus are sleepwalking through life. Rather than being alive and living life to the full, they're asleep. And so we are those who live in the light, in the daytime. We've woken up to the truth. We no longer live for ourselves, but for God. And if we as Christians um, then our lives should be distinct. They should be different. To use that same analogy, it should be as clear as night and day that we live for Jesus, that we don't get drunk like others. We don't let the things of this world master us because we live for Jesus. Paul says that's what sober living is, recognising who we are and letting our lives reflect it. But if we're honest, it's hard. It's really hard to do that. And we probably experience that just willpower on its own or a firm resolve. Well, we might be able to um, motivate ourselves to live for Jesus momentarily. But if we're going to do it each and every day, we need help. And so Paul says in verse eight, but since we belong to the day, let us be sober putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. Paul describes it like we're getting ready for war, doesn't he? But that's exactly what it is. Living life for Jesus is a spiritual battle, a war. And the good news is that Jesus has equipped us and he stands alongside us. So we have the protection of faith and love like a breastplate, ready to take the attacks and the knocks, the body blows that we will go through in life. And they may seem weak, don't they? Faith and hope, love, well, surely that's not going to protect me. But there was no stronger reaction, no stronger protection to the injustice and brutality that Jesus faced than his faith, than his love, his apparent weakness to go to the cross was the most powerful love we have ever seen. And it must have taken every ounce of Jesus's resolve, God's, God's spirit empowering him to go to the cross. Love is far from weak. Faith is not powerless. Together, Paul encourages us, they protect us, they help us to actively fight the devil whilst working for the kingdom at the same time. But we probably know that battles can be won and lost in our minds. And so God doesn't overlook that either. And it is that generosity, that graciousness of Jesus that in all situations, he gives us something uh, to fix our minds on. Hope. 
hope like a helmet. Whatever happens, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. A love which leads to our salvation when Jesus returns, a salvation that will be seen in all its fullness. We have a hope always. We have a hope which stands no matter what is going on in the world around us, a hope that cannot be taken away. Whether we meet in person or not, that doesn't change the hope that we have in anything. If anything, it only makes it all the more wonderful. Because as Paul goes on to say in verse nine, for God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's just amazing, wonderful news that we have been rescued from God's judgment. We will receive salvation. But it reminds us that not only is Jesus' return real, but his judgment is too. And so our call to proclaim Christ and the good news can't wait until the lockdown ends. It can't be put off until we get back to normal again. We have to speak up for Jesus and share the hope that we have in him. And so Paul says again, verse 10, Jesus died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another. I hope you're encouraged. I hope you've renewed your hope because Jesus has already died. He's already risen. He's already overcome death. There is nothing else for him to do, only to make it clear to everyone and to bring us to be home with him. So encourage one another. And Paul didn't <laughs> write that just to the vicar. You must encourage everyone else. No, we're to encourage each other. So the next time you call someone to find out how they are, think of something you could say to encourage them. And if you have to work it out before, even if you have to write it down, write it down. Send it to your family, to your friends, to your neighbours, because we have a hope that shines all the more brightly in the darkness. And so let's not hold back from sharing that hope. And Paul says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as in fact you are doing. However well our friends, our Christian brothers and sisters may seem to be doing, uh, we all need to be encouraged. However perfect their Christian lives may be or seem to be, they need to be built up. So let's remind each other that Jesus is coming back. That we have a wonderful, bright hope for a new day, a renewed, perfect world with Jesus. Well, as we close, Paul chose to close his letter with a prayer. And so I'm going to use uh, Paul's words, slightly changed, from the end of uh, his first letter to the Thessalonians. So let's pray. Father God, help us to rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, as this is your will for us in Christ Jesus. Father God, the God of peace, sanctify us through and through. May our whole spirit, soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, as you, the one who calls us, is faithful and you will do it. Amen.